When you're making a decision, it's pretty common practice to write out the potential pros and cons. So let's say you're deciding what to watch on TV right now. Someone pulls up The Great British Baking Show. Is it worth putting on? Pros. It's delightful. <laughs> there are cakes. The music is calming. They're in a whimsical tent. Okay, cons. Uh, uh, nothing comes to mind. I am uniformly in favor of The Great British Baking Show. All right, l let's say instead we're considering the nine-part Ken Burns documentary about the Civil War. Pros. It's important to understand the Civil War. It's a well-written and well-researched documentary series. Cons. It's boring. There are nine parts, and it's really, truly very boring. Here I'm conflicted between the show's benefits and its drawbacks. So what will I watch? We'll bring out the sponges and biscuits, because it's time for the Great British Baking Show. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell, and today I talk to Dr. Iris Snyder. She's a junior professor at the University of Cologne, and she studies the psychology of ambivalence. It's that experience of being conflicted, of seeing something both positively and negatively. Now, ambivalence has come up again and again on this podcast. It's part of the fabric of our opinions, and I think it's important, so I probably tend to bring it up a bunch on previous episodes. But this week, it's all ambivalence all the time. We're going to dive deep. In our conversation, we talk about what ambivalence is, why people try to avoid it, and why it might actually be helpful to let ourselves be conflicted. You know, one way to, to get this thing rolling is to talk about just ambivalence as a general thing. And it's, it's kind of one of those words that when people use it, they may not always be using that word <laughs> in the way that they think it means, right? So people will say, like, I feel ambivalent, which just means, like, I'm confused or I don't really care. But we know that that's not, that's not really what, what it means. So let, let's just start by laying the, the groundwork and, and have you explain what does it mean to be ambivalent about an opinion? I think to be ambivalent means to have both positive and negative thoughts and feelings about the same thing. So I think examples that make that clear is, for instance, different food items. So a cake is very attractive and it's tasty, but at the same time, you know that it might you know, interfere with your diet or your health goals. And so you have positive and negative feelings about that, but also events in your life that are important and profound milestones can evoke positive and negative emotions at the same time. So for instance, when people graduate or they leave their dorm, uh, they might feel happy and excited about the future, but also sad because they're at the end of an era, closing off a period or a chapter. Uh, in their life. And I think broadly, that is when people experience ambivalence and it has to do with the presence and, and strength of positive and negative affect, thoughts, feelings associated with one topic, one opinion, one event or person even. So when it comes to like knowing when someone is ambivalent, one of the challenges I know is that in a survey, the classic way of asking for people's opinions is on a scale from I don't like it to I like it. And the problem is that if people circle some number in the middle, it could mean that they don't care. It could mean that they don't haven't thought about it, but it could mean that they're so ambivalent that they can't pick a side that they end up in the middle. So what do we do to, to get a little technical? How could we know that someone is ambivalent? Like what kind of method would we use to, to get that from someone? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think it's so interesting that when it comes to ambivalence, there's such a disconnect between how psychologists have examined attitudes and opinions and the way people experience them. So for instance, in psychology, the typical way is to ask people how they feel or what they think on a scale going from something negative to something positive. So it can go from not at all pleasurable to super pleasurable. It can go from favorable to or unfavorable to favorable. And that assumes that 
the better something gets, the less bad something gets. But that's not how things work in the human experience, because we know from decades of research on ambivalence that does acknowledge that, that people can experience positivity and negativity at the same time. And then when people are faced with such a scale in psychological research, but also in marketing surveys and everywhere where we're trying to assess what people think, that they don't know what to do. So they're now in a situation where they want to be honest uh, and they want to express their opinion. And that opinion is one that is conflicted, right? So they feel positive and negative. So they will circle the middle of that scale. But at the same time, if people do not care, they will also circle the middle of that scale. So that's where ambiguity exists between people not caring, looking the same as people caring a lot, but caring about the positive and the negative sides. And I think in my research, there's been a lot of emphasis on that and my dissatisfaction with these, I think, limited ways of assessing the complexity of how people think and what they feel. And so what we tend to do is use older methods that have been developed around you know, 1970 and a lot has been done in the 90s too, um, where you just ask how positive people feel and how negative people feel. And you tell them, you know, these are separate things, tell us how positive and how negative uh, you feel. And then we can sort of see whether they have both positive and negative feelings at the same time. So there's two separate questions for positivity and negativity. Or I think what is a great method in psychological research is to just ask people. I mean, there is criticism on asking people to self-report on things. At the same time, they're kind of the expert on their own in our life. So I do think it's a really good method. And you just ask them to what degree do you feel mixed thoughts and feelings or do you feel conflicted about this topic? So I think that is interesting and it works quite well. And in my own work, I've tried to also look at more indirect ways to kind of assess the degree to which people feel positive and negative at the same time. And what we've tried to do is to kind of use the fact that decision making is a continuous process and that kind of during the decision, you can see what side of the topic is most dominant in people's minds. So most active, um, because when something is active, you know, for instance, when I think this is really positive, the motor systems associated with a response that could express that positivity are activated. So what we do is that we ask people to indicate whether they think something is positive or negative. And as they move their mouse to the correct response, we record where their mouse is going. And from this data, we can see that when people are responding to ambivalent topics, so for instance, different types of food, but also societal topics like immigration or gun control, we can see that the path that their mouse takes is a little bit curved. And that means that they are moving to one response, but they're also pulled to another response. Kind of think about it in a way that if you would be super clear about where you wanna go, your path is straight and direct. But if you feel like you're torn between two things, both positive and negative, your path will be a little bit more curved. And that's a method that we've um, also used in, in my lab to kind of assess ambivalence in a way that people don't know that you're asking about it. And maybe sometimes also assess the structure, just like the underlying attitude, rather than the degree to which people are aware that this is the structure. So I think that's how we do it. And I think it's an interesting way. So just to clarify, in this case, there's a like a button for good and a button for bad. And you say, click the button that reflects your opinion of this. And if I know, if I'm unambivalent and I go, this is only good, my mouse zooms straight to the good button, no wavering. But if I'm conflicted, I might still end up at the good button, but my mouse takes a little more of a circuitous path to get there. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, so that's it, totally right. It kind of reminds me like in the in like a grocery store where you're faced with a choice and you, you reach your hand out one direction and then you pull back and then you reach it out another direction. And it, you know, one of the things I've thought about with ambivalence is that it is about one topic, right? How much do I think one topic is good or bad? But that choice in the store is about a choice between two totally different things, right? And people, I think, have that experience of feeling conflicted about a choice. Is that, would you say that's the same thing as ambivalence, where I'm torn between I like this better than this? 
Is that the same as saying, I think this is both good and bad? Um, it depends a little bit on what, what, what you're looking at, right? So, so conceptually and theoretically, they would definitely be different, right? Because there's only one thing uh, versus two things. Do people experience that differently? I don't know. They probably will experience uncertainty, doubt, um, all the subjective feelings that they have from not being able to make a choice. And I think when we think about making choices, we often think about choosing between one or the other. But many choices that we make in life are also structured along, do I want this or not? Right? So when, when, when we're presented with, with information or studies about, for instance, self-control, we will always be presented with, do you choose the cookie or the apple? But the funny thing is, when I'm at a party, nobody comes along with a tray that has apples and cookies. They come along with the tray with cookies. And then I have to choose, do I take the cookie or not? So I think we often forget when we do choice uh, um, research on choice, that we always think about picking between two things. But the real struggle is at the register where you have to kind of decide not to have the candy bars that are so conveniently placed right there so that you buy them. And that I think is where ambivalence really plays a big role because it's about a go no uh, no go decision basically do i want this or not do i take this or not will i go out to exercise or not you know these are i think am i you know uh, in favor of this policy or not it's not like am i for uh, you know this policy or that policy although sometimes it is on balance but usually it's about yes or no to to one thing and I think that makes up a real, there's some research, I think, from the 90s that shows that this is about a third of decisions uh, and another third for two options. And then there's one big chunk of choices that people themselves report as, you know, when you ask them, what is an important decision that you made this week? So one chunk is about, do I want this or not? Uh, and one chunk is this or that. But a big chunk is also, I'm going to. Hmm. And people see that even as a decision, which is yeah. only a statement. So. I think in research, we often think about choice as between A or B, but I think in life, it's often about other things as well. And quite often it's about A or not A. So, so what is it then that happens if you're ambivalent, right? So you'd say, yeah, sometimes th there are some opinions that I'm not ambivalent about. There are some opinions that I am ambivalent about. Ultimately, what, what does that matter? I think it matters because ambivalent can make people uncomfortable because I think we want certainty, we want clarity, we want things to be easy, basically. Um, and that clashes a little bit with the fact that A, the world's not easy, and B, many topics are not easy. Many topics are complicated and associated with benefits and costs, with pros and cons, and with difficulty, but also with opportunity. And that can make people feel discomfort, even negative affect or uncertainty. And then when they try to resolve that, they might take less than optimal strategies to do that. And I think that is problematic because you oversimplify a choice or you make the wrong choice just to make a choice. And I think sometimes that can have detrimental effects. And I think... You just have to look around you at the polarization that we see all across Europe uh, and the US to see that maybe having strong attitudes that are only black or only white is not always the best thing. It also doesn't just hamper you in making a choice, but it also hampers you in taking up information that might be relevant uh, just because you want to stay on, on one side of your, of your spectrum. I mean, it's not for nothing that we are able to hold in mind positivity and negativity, pros, cons, at the same time. It serves the purpose that we can handle complex you know, issues and complex situations in our lives. But when we feel so uncomfortable with that, that we jump to conclusions, basically. Sometimes we jump from, how do you say it? From the pan into the fryer or something I don't know. <laughs> it's just not making things better yeah you're now you now have a strong opinion but is that the right opinion and should you even have an opinion on this hmm. so so it sounds like like people 
tend to be uncomfortable when they're conflicted, so they don't like that. But you're saying it's not it's not all that much better if you <laughs> escape that conflict, right? You just enter a new problem. Well, I think sometimes the cure is worse uh, than the poison, and I think also there is some benefits to to gain from being ambivalent, right? Because you're in a state where you can see both sides, and that puts you in sort of like a mindset that allows you to take into account a broader spectrum of opinions, information, to create new combinations of things. It's just more open-minded and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, but I mean, some people don't like broccoli, but that doesn't mean that broccoli is bad, right? I think this is a little bit how I think about it. And we know that there is some research that shows that when people have mixed emotions, they make broader associations and they become more creative. There's some work that people become more innovative, that they do better in negotiations. And so ultimately, the the outcomes beyond your current ambivalence can be good if you're able to sustain that ambivalence in a productive and constructive way. And we've done some research on this, uh, looking at people who are more ambivalent than other people, so as a trait. And first of all, we found differences. So that means that some people in general are more ambivalent than other people. So they experience ambivalence about more topics and more often in their lives. And then when you look at how these people differ from people who are low on that scale, who are low ambivalence people, we see that they tend to be less biased in their uh, decision making and in their social judgments. So they tend to judge others in a more balanced way and they tend to also fall prey less to confirmation bias. And confirmation bias and uh, fundamental attribution bias, these, these are strong biases and they can be detrimental in decision-making processes. Again, jumping to conclusions, even if they're false, just because they confirm what you already believe. And we can see examples of that all around us, um, especially with people selecting information that they, you know, they're like social media is like a buffet of information. So you can confirm any belief that you have, um, have there. Is that a good thing? No, maybe it's better to be a little bit ambivalent and not confirm uh, only one side of your um, opinion. And the same is true for um, biases in in judging others. People tend to judge others mostly in a way that defines their, their personality. So I could be walking along and I slip on a banana peel and I'll be forever called clumsy. At the same time, there was a banana peel. And when people are higher in ambivalence, they acknowledge both. So they say, well, maybe she's not, you know, maybe she's a little bit clumsy, but there was a banana peel as well, which I think is just more realistic and more balanced and definitely better for treating people fairly. Although that is the last part is speculative. (laughs) Do do you have a sense of where the causal arrow points? Because one of the things I could imagine is that it's because a person doesn't fall prey to confirmation bias. That's the reason why they tend to have all these ambivalent attitudes, because they go, I'm unwilling to go all in on one side. And for that reason, I've never, (laughs) I've never decided on anything, (laughs) because I'm always open to me being wrong. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as you describe, it kind of sounds like there's a personality type of ambivalence. And that's the reason why people avoid these biases. Mm -hmm. Do, Do you have a sense of which way that goes? Probably both ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, I research ambivalence, so you will never get a strong <laughs> right. answer from me. So you're high on trait ambivalence, yeah. Yeah, so probably, yeah, or maybe I became high on trait ambivalence. Well, <clears throat> I think it's a little bit of both. I don't think that ambivalence is the trait probably associated, and it is, we know from research, it's associated with other traits that are probably also associated with confirmation bias, but we do see it on different indices. So we see it when people make decisions, but we also see it in their information that they select. So they tend to also select more confirming and disconfirming information. Um, And the underlying trait might be that people collect information that is positive and negative. That could be, I don't know of such a trait, but I do think that this thinking about this in terms of trait ambivalence gives us a way to understand the consequences of ambivalence beyond specific topics. Right. So in research, we often examine ambivalence about X. Right. So we now examine ambivalence about junk food. And that's interesting. And we learn about ambivalence a little bit from that. A lot. I would also maybe a lot, a little. Who knows? 
Um, but to, when you look at trade and women's only, you can kind of understand what this does beyond a specific topic. So just to have a mindset that is prone to that, people thinking in an ambivalent way more than others gives you kind of like a natural quasi experiment to see what happens when people are high in that and low on that. Mm, there is some research that has also looked at it in a causal way. So they do experimental manipulations. That means that they take one group, they make them ambivalent through, for instance, asking them to think about something that made them feel positive and negative. And they compare that group to a group who thinks only about a negative thing or only about a positive thing. Uh, and there's research there that shows that people in, in the group that have been made to feel ambivalent in that moment also tend to seek out more information, even on unrelated tasks. So there is some empirical evidence that points to a causal relationship. But I also think that, you know, people, we have many ways to describe people's personalities. And uh, the ways in which we describe them probably overlap a lot. So, you know, people who are very disagreeable and never want to kind of agree with other people probably would be higher in ambivalence as well, because that's just something that overlaps with each other. When you're looking at whether someone tends to be ambivalent, are you just actually measuring their ambivalence about a lot of topics? Or are you asking them questions where people reflect on like, do I seek out both sides of an issue? Yeah, so we've done both. So um, for the research where we looked at confirmation bias and other biases, we just measured it with the skin. We just asked them, I tend to see the pros and cons. I often feel both positive and negative. I think there is positive. So what it basically reflects is people's chronic tendencies. Um, we don't ask about motivation. So we don't ask whether they, we, we don't have items like, I want to know the pros and cons. It's just that they report on what they usually do. So a chronic tendency in that um, sense. Why? Because that's an easy way to research it. Because you need, oh, they only need to answer 10 questions. Uh, and we've done this with US samples, with German samples, with Dutch samples and Singaporean samples. And it seems to work well. And there's also cultural differences that you would expect. So in Singapore, people are generally more ambivalent than people in Germany and the US, uh, which is in line with what we know about cultures that are more holistic in their processing and more tolerant to conflict. Uh, what we've also done is use uh, multi-level modeling, which is a statistical um, approach that you can apply to understand what part of your findings are explained by differences between people. This is not an easy approach because you need a lot of data. Um, so we had some data on that we collected to kind of assess or kind of show that some of the psychological tools out there that use what we talked about earlier, that use skills that go from negative to positive, are actually hiding ambivalence, but we repurposed that data um, and we uh, used multi-level modeling. So this approach to kind of tease out like how much of this is actually caused by individual differences. So how much of the differences that we see are because some people are just more ambivalent than other people. And uh, what we find is that a substantial amount of the differences in how ambivalent people are about topics can be explained in those data sets by the individual. So the differences between individuals. Um, so that kind of bolstered our idea that there are individual differences that play an important role using this large data set. We don't usually use this approach because you need a lot of people to rate a lot of topics. Um, so just for economic reasons, this is quite quite difficult to do. But we do feel confident that there is substantial variation between people, that some people are just more ambivalent than others. And more importantly, that these differences matter for the way they make decisions and the way they judge others. I, I'm noticing that this kind of personality-ish approach to, to opinions has sort of taken off, I think, maybe the last five years or so. 
And I think it's really important. So you're doing the work on uh, ambivalence. I talked to Ken DeMurray for this podcast. He's done some work on certainty. Some people just happen to be more confident in their opinions than others. Paper from a little while ago shows that some people just tend to be more negative than others. <laughs> We're doing some work on moralization. A and I think why it's important is that for so long, we we've had studies that look at one opinion at a time, right? And they go, well, if you are ambivalent about this topic, it makes you do this. But you never know, right, how much of that is because I'm ambivalent about this topic versus I'm the kind of person who does a certain kind of thing that would result in me being ambivalent about this and all topics, right? And we've actually started to do some stuff showing, like, how much of these results that we've been getting are because of the kind of person you are versus because really it's about this topic, right? Like, is it really because you're ambivalent about this <laughs> or is it that you're just, you have this disposition to, to see the world in a certain way? So what do you, I, I, you've done a lot of work in this area. Where do you see sort of that going maybe in terms of thinking about these kinds of tr things as traits about a person? So I think understanding the trait side of things is important, especially in attitude research, Be um, especially if you want to learn about how people um, form attitudes and not be limited to the attitude you're studying at that moment. And one way to do that is to study a gazillion attitudes. But of course, again, this, this, is, this is really difficult. At the same time, this research on trade ambivalence, I use it to understand how ambivalence works because ultimately personality traits are difficult to use when you want to solve problems. And when I think about my work, so what is the added value of my work in the grand scheme of things? You know, science is an emergent pattern, so not huge, but what I would like to do and what we're doing is to see how, how we can use our knowledge about ambivalence to solve problems that we are facing. And like I said before, many topics that are complicated, but that are also relevant and important in today's society are a source of ambivalence. So for instance, one big problem is, is climate change and what to do about that. And there is a lot of conflict that people have, both about their behaviors, right? I want to fly to the US three times a year, but it's not <laughs> optimal for the environment. I also want to be a good person. But also, I think we're right in the middle of a situation that, that causes a lot of ambivalence, like this global pandemic and all the ways in which we're trying to alter behavior in order to reduce the the danger and and the negative consequences of 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 the, the the coronavirus that's that's spreading so knowing how ambivalent some people are versus others will not help um, in that sense knowing how ambivalent they are about this situation will because then we know okay do we need to push them there do we need to push them there to the degree that we can at the same time when you study ambivalence as a trait, you can study it beyond the topic at hand. So that gives you direct insight or more insight or some insight into the mechanisms of that experience. Uh, and I think that is super helpful because you have more generalization. But of course, you have to really clearly understand the difference between what happens to a person chronically versus what happens in the, in the moment. Because when I feel chronically ambivalent, I'm not going to feel bad when you ask me about it. But when I feel ambivalent about COVID-19 and the, the, that I have to stay home, then I might feel bad about feeling ambivalent again. So I think it's complicated. And I think for me personally and for our lab, the trade ambivalence is a super important tool to understand the mechanics of ambivalence with the ultimate goal of using that knowledge and growing that knowledge so that we can solve some of the problems that we're facing. Uh, and we're far away from that, but that is our ultimate goal, you know, solving, I guess, societal problems, <laughs> or at least contributing to that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that um, ambivalence can have these positive outcomes, right? That it's actually, it could be useful to be ambivalent. And I wondered if you have any sense of how we can encourage people to be comfortable with that ambivalence to sort of gain those things, right? You say, if I could just set aside how uncomfortable it feels, right? Like, the broccoli problem is solvable yeah. by just convincing people to get over their initial reservations and just eat the darn piece of broccoli. Yeah. So do we know anything about what we could do to get people to say, 
I understand this is complicated and it's okay that it's complicated. And that mindset is going to be helpful. Well, I think you just answered your own question because I think that is exactly what we need to do, both in the way we research ambivalence, uh, but also more broadly in society, the tolerance for, I think, ambivalence or related constructs like indecision is low. Um, and we see, again, we see this around the world. We'd rather have idiots with strong opinions than, you know, <laughs> deliberate, um, uh, than, than sort of deliberate people who we call wishy-washy or whatever. And I think there was a politician in the Netherlands, it's my home country, um, who mentioned that recently. He says, if I stick to my opinion, you know, I'm an idiot. If I change my opinion, you call me wishy-washy. So, you know, what's it going to be? And I think we need to foster a norm that allows for complexity and that we see deliberation not as indecision. And in my lab, we're really interested in this question, right? Because there is this inherent tension between leaders having to deal with very complex matters and at the same time having to simplify them to a point that actually you're violating the nuance that is there. So what we do here is, we try to see if we can move around the context that people perceive to kind of move around how they interpret ambivalence. Um, and, and one way we do that is by saying, okay, this person, their job is to gather information, to weigh all the options, to kind of inform everybody, to make a complete picture of, this, um, of the issue. And then we um, show people a description of a person and this person is sort of ambivalent or they're not. And what we see is when we kind of emphasize that the job is to kind of think about things, to be thoughtful, to be fair-minded, to be balanced, then people recognize that you need ambivalence for that. And they will say, okay, this person is competent and this person is a really good fit for the job. But if you don't, if you leave things as they are now, basically in I think in many judgments that when we think about others, we want them to be decisive. We want them to not see both sides. We want them to come down on an issue hard and on, you know, have strong opinions. And then you show them an ambivalent person. They're like, no, this is, you know, what you would expect. This person is not competent. We don't want him. And he, um, he shouldn't be doing this job. And I think we overgeneralize this sort of demand for this kind of personality uh, because we associate competence with decisiveness uh, and with kind of strong opinions. But I think competence is a little bit more than just having, you know, a strong opinion, especially there's many situations where you just want somebody who's thoughtful and balanced and who will weigh all the options. And that was, that's what we're finding in our, in our research. And it also extends to leadership issues. So what we've noticed, for instance, is that People recognize that somebody who is more two-sided is more moral, probably, is more fair-minded, probably treat their employees a little bit better. Uh, at the same time, they're reluctant to give them power because they're worried about the indecision. And, and so we're trying to kind of find out under what circumstances can you, as a leader, get away with being honest about the complexity of the situation. And there's, I, think, I think this is super important because we also want an informed democracy. And if we cannot tolerate the complexity and nuance of many things, I think that this is bad for well-functioning societies. So that's something that we are interested in. So how can leaders kind of express ambivalence and benefit from it? And how can people elect pe leaders who have the skills to be fair-minded, to be honest, to be moral, and still have confidence in them? And I think... You know, it's not just lay people who think about ambivalence in this way. I think a lot of psychological research, especially in the attitude research that's been done, sees ambivalence per definition as a bad thing. And that's understandable because attitude research is concerned with predicting people's behavior. And um, as soon as people become ambivalent, their behavior on that topic becomes predictably unpredictable. And I think the frustration of researchers in attitude or attitude researchers has been that ambivalence is kind of like a nuisance. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so they have kind of started thinking about this relatively ubiquitous experience for people as something that you shouldn't have. And it's kind of seeped through in how they investigate it. So, you know, when when researchers ask people about ambivalence, they will say things, so how undecisive are you, right? And, and there is a connotation there that kind of reflects that per definition, people should feel bad about that. And I think it kind of mirrors how in society we think about people being ambivalent. And I think if we can change that norm in research, we're also going to see a lot more research that shows that ambivalence also has two sides. It's not just a negative thing or a nuisance uh, because you might not be able to predict what somebody does on the topic that they are ambivalent about, but maybe we can start readily predicting how much information they will gather or whether they will be more broad-minded or closed-minded or other types of behaviors that are related to the decision making, not the decision per se. So that's one side. The other side is what can people do themselves, right? So one thing is, I think, and that I've not done research on this, but this is a personal opinion, is just acknowledge that you don't know everything. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to come down on one side or the other. If you can kind of sit with the fact that on some topics you're ambivalent and you don't have to decide, I mean, I think that would be a great improvement. Of course, there's going to be topics that you have to decide on. So, you know, you'll go to a restaurant and you'll have to decide whether you'll have the cake or not, whether you'll have dessert or not. And that's fine. And that will be a little bit uncomfortable, but this will be offset by the fun you'll have with the cake. But there needs to be some acceptance to the fact that you might feel discomfort around some attitudes, and that's fine. And there might be discomfort about uh, around the fact that you're not decided and that this is a complicated issue, and that's fine. And um, there's some research now looking into the relation with mindfulness. And it seems so far that for ambivalence, that people experience less discomfort around ambivalence when they're more mindful. And kind of makes sense because we also know that more Eastern cultures, just to generalize it grossly, um, also have less problems with conflict because of the kind of the more holistic Confucius tradition that acknowledges that there's yin and yang and there's always dynamics and fluctuation. And of course, it's kind of mindfulness comes out of this Zen Buddhism So it kind of makes sense that you'll be acknowledging that there is positivity and there is negativity and yeah, there might even be discomfort and yeah, okay, fine. I think a final thing is to realize, and maybe, I don't know, maybe this would be cheating a little bit, but to realize that ambivalence is a state that reflects nuance and sophistication in your thinking. And for some, some people might feel that this is a good thing. So I think also telling people that ambivalence is not difficult because it's something you need to resolve, but it's difficult because it's important and because it reflects some level of cognitive flexibility and intelligence. I think that people would be, if they could remember that or see ambivalence as that, I think it would um, also help them to accept a relatively difficult state. It's, that reminds me of there's there's work on when people's opinions come to mind really quickly, right? Oftentimes you go, oh, those are the opinions people tend to be really confident about. They are harder to change because they're just so well connected to people's memories. But the work shows that if you can convince people that, oh, that means you haven't really thought, you didn't really think very carefully about yeah. this. If it came to mind yeah. that quickly, you didn't think about it. All of a sudden people now go, oh, I don't feel so confident in that anymore. Uh, or there's even work like when you say resistance If you are resistant to new information, that either means that you have like a strong considered opinion or it means you're 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 close minded. Yeah, you're close minded. You're not willing to see the other side. And so, yeah, I think how we think about the meaning of these things does matter. Right. So ambivalence could mean, oh, God, I I need to make up my mind. It's so horrible that I can't come up with a conclusion. Or it could mean, thank goodness that I'm taking the time. to thoughtfully consider all the information that's available without jumping to conclusions. Yeah, I love that. I think I think that's that's totally on point. And and you see this in other domains as well. So there's a work on identity based motivation. It's a completely different field. But what one of the tenets there is also that how people interpret difficulty, 
for instance, in their education or in their studies, determines how successful they are. So you can interpret difficulty as I don't belong here, I'm an idiot. Or you can interpret it in a different way and say, okay, this is difficult, so this must be really important that I do this right. Uh, and I think if we move a little bit to the to the to this side of importance and nuance and reflecting that you thought about things, um, being thoughtful and being fair-minded, I think that we can maybe shift the perspective a little bit, both in you know lay people, uh, but also in researchers. And I think it's happening already, and especially coming a push from what they call emotional ambivalence, where there's a lot more research on you know positive effects and cognitive flexibility. But I think in the attitude literature, again, because of the tradition of wanting to predict behavior, it's a little bit different still. But I think it's moving. I will keep my fingers crossed that we, <laughs> that we, that we get there someday. Uh, I just want to say thanks for, for talking about ambivalence, and, and I'll, I'll be interested to see what, what new stuff comes out of your lab. Thank you. I had a good time. All right, that'll do it for another episode of Opinion Science. Thank you to Edith Schneider, or you know what? She gave me permission to pronounce it Iris Schneider, <laughs> the way my American face wants to say it, but, but I thought I would try to give it a go. Anyhow, thank you so much to her for talking about her work and sharing her thoughts on the role ambivalence plays in our lives. You can check out the show notes for a link to her lab website and links to the research we talked about. To learn more about this show, head on over to opinionsciencepodcast.com. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever you use, and leave a nice review to let the world know what this show is all about. Okie doke, that's it for now. See you in a couple weeks for more Opinion Science. Bye-bye. <laughs>